Um, so, uh, yeah, like Nuritsi said, I'm Joki. I am uh, based in Berlin where I work for Endless um, as a software engineer. And I'm going to talk about the uh, application story uh, at Endless. So, uh, let's start with a bit of history. Wait a second. Yeah, so uh, let's talk about how we got to where we are. Um, how many of you do not know a lot about Endless? Okay, we got some people. Um, so Endless, uh, so Endless is a startup uh, based in San Francisco, California, and uh, what we do uh, is to um, basically deliver uh, computing uh, to um, to uh, the next billion users and. Uh, those are a lot of users, and by computing, I mean uh, basically information and content. Uh, that means also education, you know, uh, basically what we do every day and what we take for granted. But the, it happens that those users uh, live in regions with very uh, poor internet connectivity or inexistent at all. So it has a set of challenges, and, um, and I'm going to talk about what we do to deliver the applications. Uh, it's gonna be slightly technical, not so much, um, but hopefully you'll see, like you'll get an idea of, of, the, of uh, the decisions that we, we take uh, and the things that we do to accomplish this. So, funny thing, uh, the Endless OS uh, that Endless does, it started as an app itself, so it was an Android app. I thought it was funny to mention mm -hmm. that. Uh, then it was still an app, a 5GTK1 um, application. And uh, yeah, so, so in this case, we were using already a distro in the traditional sense of it. Um, it was, um, yeah, it was a traditional uh, distro. You had packages. Uh, Alex talked about the problems with the packages, so uh, that saves me a little bit of time. Uh, but basically, yeah, nobody, nobody wants to uh, update uh, you know, install a security update and then everything breaks and uh, that's very bad but it's especially bad when you have no, uh, when you have very limited connectivity, right? You update stuff and then maybe next, maybe next week that's when you got internet again because you ran out of your data plan. So that's, that's even more of an issue um, in those places. So, so it's also an issue if if your if your system breaks at all because you you don't you, you, you don't go and you download uh, the system again and you and you install it in those places right so we wanted to make a very solid system uh, for our users uh, and we started using OS3 for that and I thank Alex for having explained what it is uh, so now I don't have to <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah so so we have a base uh, OS3 and that's immutable so you don't install you don't go and install stuff in the system and change stuff in the system that much um, so for that we, we we implemented the app bundles I, I will keep looking at that because this is really tiny here I cannot read the, the slides um, so uh, yeah so we implemented custom uh, app bundles uh, by bundle in this case I mean there, there, was, there was no sandboxing at all it was more like um, you know it's just a way to have uh, the, the application contained in one place and not distributed across the system, uh, if you will. Um, yeah, and, uh, and uh, the thing with it is that while it worked for our use case, it's very difficult to go to, say, Twitter or Spotify and say, oh, we got, we got a bundle, so we're endless. Do you want to, do, to, to make you know, an application uh, for us? Do you want to port your application to our app bundles? Um, Apart from supporting RPMs and uh, DABs and all of that, you want to do, to do it for us. It's not. It's difficult to go to people with that, right? So luckily, flatback happened, and we jumped right in. Um, yeah. So uh, Alex uh, explained already what flatback is. It gives us many things. Uh, not only the, the the bundling that I was talking about before, but it also gives us sandboxing. So the you know. We make sure we make sure that apart, apart from having a system that is um, that has a, like a solid base and a, an immutable base, uh, we, we can have like applications that don't go and steal your files. So that, that's always uh, good. Um, 
It's it's uh, cross distro, right? Uh, and that's a very strong point, I think, because it makes it it makes it very easy to promote. Uh, because now you can go to to Spotify, for example, and say, okay, instead of having the RPMs and the devs and 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 whatnot, why don't you just support uh, Flatpak and you get all that for free? Uh, so I think that's very important. And uh, we started using it. And uh, yeah, so. I'll talk a little bit about the flat package infrastructure we, we got. Um, basically, even though uh, the, the uh, builder, uh, flat pack builder is, is quite nice, we actually use uh, the Debian, uh, we use Debian packages uh, to, to basically build the, the, our flat pack apps uh, using a custom script uh, that we have. Um, the reason for that is that we already had uh, so our system, even though it's, a, it's an OS3, it's built out of, uh, of, of a Debian base. So we already have that. And also, um, while I think Builder wo works very well if you have one application, uh, if you have many of those, you don't want to be compiling the same uh, dependencies all, all the time because it will take a long time. But yeah, in the future, we might change that, right? Um, so yeah, and uh, besides that, I think we were also some of the first pushing some, some, some uh, you know, at least using some things uh, extensively like, like the uh, flatback branches. So flatback branches are like the versions, if you will, of, of the content. Uh, the way we, we use them is uh, we have a master branch. Uh, that's where applications are pushed to, if you will. Uh, and that's, that's considered to be like the end stable, right? It's the last stuff you got. So things get promoted to this um, uh, release branch that is like EOS, uh, in this case it's like EOS 3.0, it will be 3.5 uh, and all that. And then we have another branch uh, that you know, just has the major uh, version uh, number there. Uh, like in this case, uh, currently we have EOS 3.0 and then we have the stable branch that it, uh, that's called EOS 3. That is basically like a sim link to the US 3.0, just because it makes it easy to uh, to upgrade people, right? Um, if your system is is pointing to US 3.5, and then we change the name of the branch, it's just easy that we have something else that won't change the, the its name its name as as, as often. Um, yeah. So uh, and then there are, there are remotes. So uh, remotes are like uh, pointers to repositories to to uh, flatback repos, basically. We have we have more than two here, but these are the ones that, that kind of uh, explain what's going on. Uh, we have the US apps um, remote. That's where we put all the applications we build. Um, and then we have the runtimes one. Uh, in this case, I you know I mentioned the US EMD64 because it's the one that we, we've been trying, uh, we've been testing uh, thoroughly uh, lately. That's where we've been focusing. Uh, and those have the, the runtimes, right? So, so you have the platform runtime that is used to uh, to run the applications, and we have the SDK runtime that is used to to build them. And uh, yeah, and uh, so the so the runtimes uh, re repository doesn't have uh, an AppStream um, branch. That means that we don't have we don't have metadata about the runtimes because it's not so uh, important in this case. We do have the, the version, of course, but but the, the metadata, uh, the app stream data, uh, is is of course present in the EOS uh, in the EOS apps uh, uh, remote, um, and that's the basically that's a, a branch with a file that describes all the applications, right? Uh, so, like uh, like uh, Alex said, it's gonna it's gonna tell you the name, uh, like the readable name of the application. It's gonna tell you the, the version, the description. Uh, many things like that, and we use it for, for for many things apart from what's expected to be. Because you can you can ship metadata in that, and that's useful if you want to get some to some stuff that I will explain uh, later. So uh, so let's talk about GNOME software. GNOME software in here, even even though it has this name, this generic name, it's actually an application. It's uh, it's GNOME's uh, App Center. Um, yeah, so just like any app center, you got uh, you can do you can install applications, you can remove applications, you can search for them, browse, 
there is this cool feature that, that, I, that I think it's very nice also for our users, which is you can mark an application. Um, if you're on offline, you can still uh, mark an application to be installed later, and when you get online, it, it basically installs them right away. So, so that's cool, and um, this is how it looks. Uh, this was compiled, this version, uh, three days ago. So basically, this is what's going on. Uh, this is uh, like the landing page. Then there are more sections uh, that I didn't take screenshots of. Um, yeah, so we used that, but we made some changes, uh, and you're going to see why. That's the whole point of this talk. <laughs> uh, and um, so, so GNOME software, is, uh, it follows this architecture where uh, it's very uh, highly pluggable. Like the way you uh, manage the applications is uh, through uh, plugins. So you're going to have a plugin. There's the uh, package kit plug, right? That's the one that will, uh, if you're running uh, like a traditional distro, it will uh, get your packages and say, okay, you got the, uh, I know, you got the, the game package, and, and that's here. Then you have like a, a, an AppStream plugin that goes and says, oh, uh, you got the GIMP uh, package, so I GIMP. and uh, I got the description and the screenshots. Let's Put that together. Um, so there are many, many plugins, um, and uh, and we created two for us. Uh, one of them uh, has this, uh, you know, expected name. It's called EOS, and it's to do everything related to the that is like closely related to to our desktop. And uh, then the other one is called External Apps, and uh, I'll get to that. So first, uh, the uh, EOS um, plugin. Um, I don't know if you ever saw the endless uh, desktop, but we have this nice uh, grid of uh, application shortcuts. So I think the idea is to, is to be uh, as easy to launch um, applications as as a smartphone. Uh, and uh, and yeah, so uh, in GNOME software uh, didn't really support the idea of uh, of um, of uh, shortcuts because GNOME doesn't have shortcuts. So uh, that's one feature we added to it that's upstream. Uh, it's not used upstream, but, it, but it's, it's, uh, it's in. And uh, downstream, we, we, we do use it. And uh, as you see in the screenshot below, uh, it, ha it has on the right, it has like a link saying remove shortcuts so you can control the shortcuts from, from inside uh, the, the GNOME software. Uh, and also, if you do it on the shell, it also gets reflected uh, in there, right? So that this was the first thing that uh, we, we had to implement, and that's why we created this uh, plugin. Then it got more complex. Um, we have, uh, it sounds very bad, we have, uh, we have something that is like a blast li a blacklisting uh, applications, uh, because, uh, like I said, we have, um, we have the three branches, um, like master, EOS, um, uh, 3.0, and stuff like that. So, if, so all those applications, uh, all those branches are in the EOS apps uh, remote. And that means that uh, GNOME software, the way it works currently, uh, it would show you all the applications for all the branches. Uh, we usually don't want to do that. Uh, it might change in the future, I'm sure it will, uh, but right now we just want to say, okay, you, you have the default, your default branch is EOS 3.0, it's, uh, it's not master, so we just want to show the applications that belong to that branch, right? Um, so basically, we have to go. Our, our plugin goes and says, uh, "Oh, there's a new, uh, there's an application I just found. What's the branch? And if it's the wrong branch, blacklist." Uh, it also blacklists non-desktop applications because you know we don't want to show our users uh, stuff like um, uh, you know uh, fonts and uh, and uh, input methods because our users. I didn't get into it a lot, but it's like uh, our users, uh, they range from people that, you know, they, they, they know about computers, they've used them before, uh, up to people that had never touched a computer. And, and there's a, a, like a, a big number of our users are in this uh, case. They, they had never used a computer, so, so if you show them applications, they, 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 I think it's, um, it's easy to understand what's going on. If you show them like fonts and input uh, selectors and whatever, it, it gets complex and we try not to confuse people. Uh, oh, there's another thing. Yeah, so uh, so Endless uh, has uh, still a bunch of applications that um, 
they will change, but right now uh, they we have basically a build of the application per locale. So so you have like a Spanish version of the encyclopedia application. We have a Portuguese version and an English version, and uh, Obviously, GNOME software didn't know about that, so, so it shows everything to us, and we have to make sure that we block the ones uh, that are not compatible with the, the user local. Um, yeah, so, and the last major thing uh, that the, the, um, the plugin does is that um, we have this uh, service, like, it's like a service, uh, special service application. So basically, it's like a, an application that is used by the others uh, to provide um, a, a search uh, through their content into the desktop. So when you search for stuff uh, in the desktop, you can actually do the search inside the application that you got installed. Um, that application is called EKN Services. Uh, there is no metadata about it because we don't want to show an icon for it, right? We don't want to show stuff like that. It's just, uh, you know, uh, it's a service. So. Uh, we didn't want the users to go and see an update for something that is a service and they don't understand really what it is. Um, and then they also have to update the platform runtime. So what we did was when we have an update for any of those, applica uh, any of those uh, not applications, but like runtime or the services app, uh, we create this uh, dummy proxy app that is called Endless Platform. And, it, and when you click uh, install the update, it will basically install the, the other stuff that is uh, that I just mentioned. Uh, you know, tricks like this that we try to do to make uh, users' lives easier, I guess. Uh, yeah, so the other plugin is called, uh, is, is the external applications plugin. By external apps here, uh, I'm talking about like third party applications. So uh, currently, um, that will change, but but currently we are building uh, all the applications that we are shipping. Um, I don't know. We build uh, Gedit. We build a bunch of games uh, apart from our own applications. But we cannot go grab Spotify and uh, grab Dropbox and and, and uh, you know just put them on our servers because uh, they're proprietary. We don't have a license for that. Uh, but but still, we don't want our users to go and. Um, you know, first find out that they cannot install a uh, Debian package uh, and then have to go like uh, out of their way to, to be able to run Spotify because and uh, and they still uh, they want to use the same things that we that we use. So uh, so we try to make the experience uh, of, uh, of installing it as seamlessly as, as possible. Um, so yeah, so what we what we did for that is that usually you have an application an application is um, it's basically it's it's uh, it's uh, in in what comes to Flatpak, it's uh, the libraries that it uses, plus the very own application binaries, right? So uh, we can ship the the dependency libraries because usually those are even like uh, uh, free software uh, libraries. We cannot ship uh, the the application binaries uh, themselves. So. That means that uh, for for uh, for a normal uh, or a non, like a free application, we can go on the on the left and we just say, okay, let's build a, a flat pack out of it uh, as, as as normally, and then we put it uh, on our on our repository and people install it, and it's that's the way it goes. That's the, the normal way. You know, on the right, uh, it shows how an external application is installed. So basically, we 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 divide this notion of application into two uh, things. The first is like uh, we call it the headless app, so it will have only the, the dependencies um, that the, um, that this main app would use, um, plus a wrapper script, and this is a script that knows how to launch the you know the, the real application. So basically, there is no there is no binaries that are related at all to the application that we're building. It's just that we we build this thing and we call it. Uh, let's use the Spotify example. Okay, uh, we build an, uh, uh, an application called Spotify. It doesn't have anything related to Spotify except for the name and the description and all of that. That part we can put in our service. And then we use uh, a special key in this metadata uh, file uh, that, that tells us, that tells our plugin that this uh, application is special. It's like an external app and also tells us where to fetch 
the real application. So when you when the user presses install, it installs the the, the Flatpak um, headless app. So there's no content, and as soon as it's as it's, uh, as it's finished installed, um, it goes and fetches the Spotify uh, Debian uh, file. It it downloads it. It builds uh, it builds it locally, and uh, as a, as a runtime extension, uh, yeah, and, and installs it. So a runtime extension. Uh, trying, trying to not to make this too confusing, but a runtime extension is like is like uh, the runtimes that uh, Alex uh, mentioned, but these are basically extensions. So th these are like uh, these are like smaller uh, runtimes. So these smaller runtimes are the ones that are going to have the the, the application binaries, and uh, when we run the application, the application mounts that runtime into a path and the wrapper script knows what it is and just launches the, the Spotify launcher, for example. So uh, I don't know if this was too confusing. Uh, maybe maybe it was. Uh, but it's also, the good news is that it's, it's temporary, right? We want our users currently to be able to install all these. We don't want to support this hack forever. Um, you know, because it has uh, problems, uh, and uh, so the good thing is that we're gonna we're gonna implement it inside Flatpak uh, soon. Uh, basically, it's gonna do something very similar to this. The big advantage is that we will we will not have to have a, a plugin on on GNOME software for this. We just say install uh, GNOME, uh, sorry install Spotify. and uh, and Flatpak itself knows uh, how to fetch the binaries, uh, how to do that all. And we won't have a, a runtime extension plus a headless application because in case one of them gets uninstalled for some reason, then you have a, bro a broken ap application. Um, and yeah, and, and by doing it in, in Flatpak, it means that it will work in any distro or sorry, in any deployment of Flatpak, not only at Endless, because this only works now if you have this uh, plugin, the external apps plugin, right? So yeah, so there's Spotify running from a Flatpak in our uh, operating system. Yeah, it works pretty well. Uh, yeah, so that's cool. <laughs> and um, up, so those were the two biggest um, changes to, to, to GNOME software, uh, I'd say. We also do some UI changes um, because some, some things, um, you know, some things we think they should be simpler, and other things uh, we want to make them like more engaging to, to our users. So I don't know if you remember the you know when I talked about the custom app bundles. There was this uh, this nice screenshot that I forgot to talk about, and and it, it had like a, an app store that we built. That was a custom app store we built, um, and it was very engaging, uh, uh, you know, very visually appealing, and and GNOME software. Uh, you know, it's it's it looks a bit more bland, I'd say. So we did some some UI changes uh, with our um, design team. We work very closely uh, with the GNOME design team. So many of the things that you saw on the screenshot of, of the of the vanilla GNOME software uh, was actually contributed by by our design team. Um, but yeah, so one of the of the changes that we do downstream. Uh, is the uh, the use of the shortcuts uh, like that I have mentioned? Uh, not not much more to talk about that. Uh, a big one is that uh, you know instead of, instead of having the, the category, I should I should have the other screenshot here to, to compare. But instead of having like a, a couple of applications plus the categories in the front, um, we actually moved uh, uh, the categories to the left uh, on a vertical list. Um, because you know that that was that was the way that our users uh, apparently respond better to, to using uh, the software. Uh, and besides that, uh, we have these uh, nice application tiles uh, that we had already before. So those look very nice. They're not exactly the the, the, the icon of the application, but they give a, a nice hint to the user uh, what it is about. So we use that um, instead of just using the icon. Um, yeah, so when you when you use your mouse and you hover to one of those, uh, there is this effect that comes up, 
and it shows the application icon uh, and, uh, and the app name. And it also, I thought it was interesting to talk about this change. It's like we don't show immediately that, that the, uh, on the tile that the application is installed, only when you hover. And even though, even I, I thought in the beginning, well, this might be troublesome because um, how do you find that an application is installed quickly? Uh, turns out that, you know, when you ship images that are preloaded with a lot of content and most of the applications are installed, it makes no sense to go and say install, install, install if you have like maybe 10 apps that are not installed, right? So the default is for things to be installed and that's why we, we you know, we assume that and we make that change uh, in, the, in the UI. Um, what else? So if you're familiar with uh, GNOME software, you know that when you click on an application and you go to its details page, you get uh, the screenshots, the description, the icon, uh, the buttons to install and remove, of course, and then you get you get a lot of details uh, down below, um, like saying that if the application is sandboxed, in our case, everything is sandboxed, so, you know, uh, and uh, whether the application uh, is translated to the to the user's language and all of that. So it, it's just a, a lot of content uh, and we had to simplify that. Otherwise, you know, it, it's just too much information um, to, to our typical user. So yeah, it gets a little bit simple uh, sometimes. And um, yeah, so that was the, the, those were the changes or the main changes we did to GNOME software. We work very actively uh, uh, upstream uh, as well. So the way we do is that we usually uh, implement stuff upstream Especially if it's some if it's something like in the core, not exactly in the UI, because if it breaks too much, there's no no point in uh, in, in trying to push. That's more of a you know a task for the for our design team together with the GNOME design team. Um, but yeah, and uh, those were that's the story about GNOME software. Uh, I also thought that would be interesting to to mention a couple of other things related to our our applications. Um, I don't know if you heard. It, but the another big part of the whole endless um, mission is to offer an asynchronous internet to our users. So these are users that, for example, they have a data plan that can only connect at night because uh, you know because of costs and stuff like that. So or they can only connect once per week. So instead of saying, okay, now you have two hours of internet, go do stuff, uh, and they you know, uh, yeah, I remember when I had like this. Uh, 4K uh, router, and I had to film the time, and I was, you know. So instead of having that, what we have is a um, is an ecosystem of applications uh, that display content um, to the user. So when the user the user has that 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 scene, it doesn't require uh, the user to be online. However, when the user gets online, uh, they um, the applications uh, they uh, they basically synchronize and they get the new content. So an example of that. Is the is the Presa Libre application, uh, which is the Presa Libre is the biggest newspaper in Guatemala, I think, and uh, you have the an application that you know shows you the the articles, and when you when you when you do have internet, it just synchronizes with with the latest stuff. Um, it's not complicated. It's something very basic. It's something that is not out there, and we that's why we we are doing it. Uh, if you want to know more about it, uh, then uh, once you have the slides, you can you can. I got links for uh, for the Guadex uh, this year's Guadex talks, uh, where Jonathan Blandford talk, talks about this in, in good detail. The other thing is that you know those applications uh, they um, they get a bunch of content from from Wikipedia, from uh, newspapers, from uh, you know a lot of sources. We have to display that content, and uh, and for that you can even go and do your own stuff, right? Uh, or you can have a nice uh, a nice UI library to display the content because it already knows which widgets work better, which layouts work better. Um, so, so we we uh, during this uh, year's Vadek we open source uh, the library that we we've, we've been developing for uh, for building these applications. It's called the Knowledge Lib. Uh, yeah, and uh, and it's basically yeah what I said. It's a simple way to 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 show the the. Uh, Applications. Um, it's written instead of being written in uh, you know the same way that that you do code on GTK or you have this UI tool. 
Uh, currently, you have a declarative language, so you, you write the stuff in, in uh, YAML. Um, yeah, so I think it makes it very easy to, to, to put up an, an application very quickly to display uh, content like that. And uh, yeah, there is all, uh, the, so like I said, it was open source that uh, Wadex, so there is also the recordings of that talk that you can later check out. And uh, in case you're wondering, this is uh, this is how it looks. I can show you later a little demo, but this is how it looks like. This is the the how-to app. Um, yeah, and basically it shows content. Uh, the thing is that the content comes from, from elsewhere and gets synchronized. Now, future work, um, yeah, lots of text that I cannot read here. Uh, uh, so, uh, so we, like I said, we're building all these applications in uh, in uh, in our uh, servers. That's what we uh, we're doing. That's not scalable, right? We we cannot go and say, oh, you got a new game coming out. That's cool. Let's build it. Um, so, <laughs> so with Flatpak, that's that's. Um, that's very convenient that we can just uh, configure uh, a bunch of, of remotes and the user gets the content, right? So in the future, we plan to do that. Um, and it also gives more independence to the user, right? We, we never never try to control what the user uh, is, is uh, seeing. So this is the way to go. Uh, it's going to happen pretty soon. Um, another thing that is happening as we speak uh, is that we're adding support uh, to Flatpak to, uh, to support multiple um, installation paths. So uh, if you know about Flatpak, it, it, it has two main installation paths currently. It's the user's uh, path that installs stuff in your, in your home. Um, and then it has the system uh, installation path that installs stuff in your system that is available for other users, right? Um, at Endless, by the way, we install everything in the system because we want every user of a, of a computer to have access to, to it. Uh, the thing is that we also have uh, hardware that uh, doesn't have a lot of space uh, in the system's uh, partition, but it does have a, an SD card. So, so that's why we, we need uh, like uh, other installation paths to, to for the user to install uh, content. Uh, what else? Um, yeah. So the third one is kind of complicated to talk about, but I think it's still interesting. Because it shows like uh, how we take how we take decisions, so it's not yet implemented. But it's like um, currently when, when you build um, the the uh, app applications, you get the, this AppStream data, but it, the AppStream data has all the applications that you got available uh, on your on your uh, repository. Uh, so that means that when you install our when you buy our computer, for example, or or, or some other computer with with Endless. And then you go to the mountains and you don't have internet, you open GNOME software and you see a bunch of applications. Uh, most of them will be installed, uh, that's the idea, but some of them will not, and you will still see it uh, in there as available. Uh, when, so, so, so when you have internet, you can, you can download them, right? And that's, that's reasonable. The thing is that some users will very likely never get internet. So, uh, so you know, they shouldn't see content in there like, oh, uh, look at this, uh, so many nice games that you cannot install ever. Um, so we, so you know, we, we will. Uh, I think very, very, very soon, we will just go through the app stream and just um, discard the ones that are not installed, because anyway, when the user connects to the internet, it gets up updated, and then it, then they get all the content, right? Uh, yeah. So uh, like supporting the external application that I talked about that I talked about inside Flatpak, that's also very important, uh, and uh, and the. the the two last ones is that we really want Flatpak to succeed, right? We want, uh, that's why we, we're betting on it uh, real time, and we want, um, we want application developers to go and instead of now testing whatever uh, package format is out there, just focus on Flatpak and uh, you'll be, you know, it's going to make everyone's lives easier, it's going to make our users happy, it's going to make, it's going to be awesome. And, uh, yeah, and we also want to promote our knowledge app. Uh, so if you want to check it out, uh, go ahead. Uh, we surely would like people to try that. And um, that's it. How much time do I got? I got like five minutes, I think. Yeah, cool. So let's see. I'm going to give you a demo on my development VM. 
right? And uh, with the master images that were breaking uh, a few days ago, and so this is the disclaimer, right? Because if it fails, you you don't laugh. Well, you can laugh. Uh, yeah. So let's see. Um, we got this is the desktop, by the way. Yeah. Oh. A second. Okay. So this is the desktop. Um, yeah, I don't have it here. So um, we got we got uh, you know we got a, a bar down below that's that's you know that's deja vu. Uh, we got we got uh, a grid of the applications icons. Like I said, you can you can search for stuff uh, like that. Um, yeah, not not the bad, a good word, but uh, yeah. So so we have uh, all these applications. These are all flat pack. Uh, we do have some applications that are in the system, by the way. Um, from for a couple of reasons, but uh, the idea is that you have very limited applications in the system, and everything else is going to be flat back. Um, that's where we're going. So let's open one. Uh, no, let's open uh, the App Center, right? So that's it. Uh, you can see that if you use like Fedora uh, or Debian or even Ubuntu, because now uh, Ubuntu started using this year and they started using GNOME software as well. Um, you're going to see that it's very different how it looks, uh, but the behavior is essentially the same. So like I was saying, there is this hover. I don't have a lot of applications installed, but the ones that are installed, they do uh, have a tag, uh, like I showed before. So you got the yeah, you got the the, the label, the, sorry, the categories in here, uh, and when we click them, you click an app, you're gonna see the uh, the app details, right? Screenshots. Um, you can install an application. Uh, let's launch an application. Let's see. Uh, okay, so uh, we got we got Spotify here. It's installed. Very conveniently installed. Uh, so there you go. It's it's running. It hopefully it even plays stuff. Yeah. So uh, what else? <coughs> oh, let, let's test the. Uh, sorry. Let's test the. Uh, the shortcuts stuff. Oh man, it's a difficult. Uh, so we got the Spotify in there, right? And uh, there you go. Amazing, right? Uh, uh, so yeah, I guess I guess that's it. Um, go flat back. <laughs> try our stuff. Uh, to check out Endless, and by the way, I have a, a last slide thing. Uh, yeah, so, so like I said, uh, every day on, on, on IRC, we go to this uh, GNOME software, some of us, uh, GNOME software uh, channel, and we, we talk about stuff in there. If you want to join the development, uh, you're surely welcome. Uh, also, if you want to check out Endless, uh, check our uh, community uh, forum. Uh, it's very interesting, you know, because many people from many different backgrounds in there. Um, and I guess that's it. Thank you so much. Questions? Yeah. When will my you know, software look that good? <laughs> uh, so, like, like I said, so like I said, like uh, honestly, one reason that it doesn't look as, as shiny is that it's very difficult to have those shiny images for every app, right? It's very difficult to ask a, a, a software developer to, 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 to design a good logo for their, for their uh, application, let alone something else, right? Uh, like like the, those squares that you saw. Um, our, our GNOME design, uh, our, our design team, uh, they do stuff and they, and they, um, they all, they, they Basically, they're, they're in touch with the GNOME design team, and um, 
we know that sometimes uh, it's it's very difficult to make stuff that uh, that is uh, the best for the regular Linux user and, and the best for our own users. Uh, so sometimes we have to diverge. Uh, that's not a negative thing, I think. Um, but yeah, they, they, I mean, like the screenshot that I showed before uh, was uh, was actually like the, um, uh, I don't know, like so. Yeah, here. So, so those categories were, were, were done in collaboration with with the endless design team. Um, yeah, and I guess it, it will. I mean, it's gonna look good. <laughs> I don't know what else to say. <laughs> question was, I have to repeat it for Nuriti. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the question was how we deal with timeout uh, in the applications um, because uh, you work with a lot of applications that go bananas when you when you're off, when they're offline. Um, well, like you said, it's it, I think it's up to the application developers to do that. Uh, if you look at um, if you look at the GNOME, uh, sorry, the, the Android uh, guidelines, they have they have stuff about that, right? They have stuff like how you should behave when, when you don't have a connection. Uh, we would love to, to have uh, those guidelines as well for, for our GNOME or Linux uh, apps, if you will. Um, the way we deal with it is that by default we assume uh, in our in our apps we assume that we're offline, okay? Uh, it, because the you know connectivity is just for updating the application. And uh, and it's not up to the user to go and have to you know uh, update it uh, themselves. So so basically, you're just opening an application that has content, and uh, and the connectivity is only related to when the content was updated. This is, this doesn't work, of course, for 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 all the for all the um, apps. <coughs> but, but if you open Twitter right now on uh, on on your Android or whatever. Uh, with the airplane mode on, you'll, you're going to see that it still shows you the, the latest tweets that it's got, and I think that's that's actually the the way it should be, right? Don't don't simply disappear if there is no connectivity. Uh, you know, I've, I've been in the U.S. for for the past week uh, and a couple of days without any data plan, and I feel the pain. And I have internet all the time, like most of the of the day, but I feel the pain when I uh, when I go out and I don't have it. Or I'm in the bus and I and I I have my RSS reader app and I opened it up and it doesn't have anything cached, so keep that in mind, I guess. Um, more questions? Yeah. Uh, have you gotten in touch or talked to people? You know how people make all sorts of. Uh, special purpose distros like the distro for graphic designers, a mm -hmm. distro for like spin offs, right? Yeah, like that. for yeah. GIS okay. users. Um, have you talked to any of them? Like, I could see those kinds of distros maybe not disappear, but um, if people start actually shipping their applications with Flatpak, you know, then it becomes much easier for users to just. Them. Yeah. So, but the question is, if we talk to them, if you if you have a, if you have had any sort of conversation with those people that make those. Distros. Okay. So, so the question is, uh, for the record, uh, um, if we talked with uh, people that are doing these kind of uh, specialized, specialized uh, applications uh, like stu studio or, or imaging uh, distros. Uh, if we talk to them, because it makes no, s it might make no, no sense if you can install all those applications very easily. Uh, well, I, myself, I haven't. Uh, I would say that um, that's more a question, I guess, for Alex. But I would say that that the answer is, if it's something that the user suddenly goes to the, the to that, um, we're also talking about like an app store uh, in the flatback for 
soon. If the user goes to, to some place like that, and they can install on one click, uh, like a, I don't know, a, a, a bundle of, uh, of, of all the bundles related to, to design, and that's very easy. That's a positive thing. You're gonna unblock the time of, of the people that were working on those specialized distros, so that's very positive, I think. I have no more time, so thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed. Check the links out and uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. Yeah.